Let's look at another example also involving pure rolling. What I have here is a long roller that's basically just a, you know, a heavy cylinder, okay, uniform cylinder of radius R, and rolls without friction, uh, I'm sorry, without slipping on a lawn. Okay, to pull it, I'm going to use a horizontal force attached to the center of the long roller, which is also the center of mass. I'm going to pull it with a force F. You know if I pull it too hard, you're going to stop, start sliding, right? Assuming that you don't pull that hard, so the rolling is a pure rolling without slipping. As a result, uh, there will be a backward friction, you know, on the lawn. Otherwise, this force, if, if were the only horizontal force, it would have produced no torque. So the long, long roller would not roll with an, with an acceleration. So you're not going to have pure rolling. You just have sliding. Okay, so there is a friction. The question is, suppose I apply force F. Can I find a center of mass acceleration? Okay, can I find a center of mass acceleration? Well, there are a couple of things we can think of. If you want to know the center of mass acceleration, you've got to know all the horizontal forces, including the backward friction, Fs. How do you know the backward friction? Well, the backward friction about the center of mass, if you look at the center of mass as a reference point, this is the only force providing a torque, okay, providing a torque about the center of mass. And that torque is necessary to sustain an angular acceleration alpha, which keeps up with linear acceleration, ACM. So what you can do is you write down the center of, uh, you know, Newton's second law for linear motion about the center of mass. You also write down the uh, torque theorem applied to the center of mass about uh, so that you have a force Fs providing a torque. And then you also write down ACM equals alpha times R, R being the radius of the long roller. You got three equations. You can solve for Fs, you can solve for ACM, you can solve for alpha. Okay, we learned how to do that before. Now, another approach, which is easier, which is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do both uh, approaches anymore. I'm just going to look at the easier ones. Point A. I'm going to apply torque theorem to point A. Why? Because I don't, know, I don't have to know what Fs is anymore. Okay, so F becomes the only force providing the torque. And therefore, uh, from that, I know immediately what alpha is because I know what torque is. Torque is provided by this given force F. Okay, so about point A. is equal to I is equal to F times R. R is the lever arm from here to there. Right? And that equals to IA alpha. It's a long roller in the form of uniform disc, uniform cylinder. So about the center of mass, ICM is one half MR squared. You add another MR squared to move it to here, that is three halves MR squared. That's IA times alpha. So immediately you know what alpha is. From alpha, let's find ACM. Okay, so ACM equals alpha R. What is alpha? Alpha is 2FR divided by 3MR squared. So it's 2FR over 3MR squared times another R. Another R here. So what is the answer? It is equal to 2F over 3M. That's less than F over M. F over M would be equal to ACM if there were no friction. But there is a friction. Okay, at this point, we're ready to find the force of friction if we need to. You see, you have uh, F going forward minus Fs going backward. Isn't that equal to ACM times the mass? That's the ACM right here, 2F over 3M. You, you multiply by M, don't you get... 2 over 3, F. That's less than F because there is an Fs. So immediately you find Fs to be equal to one-third of the pulling force. It's an interesting result. The harder you pull, the more friction you're going to get. The friction is always equal to one-third of the force that you pull. Why? Because you need, with a greater pulling force, the center of mass has a greater acceleration than before. To sustain pure rolling, Alpha would have to increase as well, and alpha is provided only by this Fs. So Fs has to increase proportionally with F. That makes perfect sense. And by the way, Fs cannot exceed its greatest possible value, which is maximum value of mu s n. What's n? n is the contact force in a horizontal surface, n is just equal to mg. All right? 
So therefore, what's the greatest force you can possibly pull with? One third F has to be less than that. So F has to be equal or less than three mu S mg. That is the greatest force you can pull the long roller with. If you exceed that force, what happens? You are not going to be able to provide enough static friction to sustain pure rolling anymore. You are inevitably going to start sliding at point A. That is another example of pure rolling. Another common example involving pure rolling involves a incline followed by a vertical circular track. A ball of small radius starts from the top of the incline, it descends a distance h in pure rolling and it rolls up past through point b, reaching point c and making the complete circle. Okay, you learned in the case without any friction, a, a box sliding down, what is the lowest position, uh, lowest height h it must slide, start from so that you can clear this. The way we did that was to make sure first of all two things, conservation of energy between point a and point b, okay, and secondly, at point B, I'm sorry, point C, and secondly, at point C, you must have a minimum speed so that you can still do circular motion. We do something very similar here in the case of pure rolling. We still can use conservation of energy, right, as we explained in the previous problem. Point A and point C, the, the object has the same amount of total energy, except that you have to add rotational energy into the mix. And secondly, the center of mass is doing a circular motion at this point. It cannot have zero speed. It must have a minimum speed. Okay, so how do you solve this problem? What is the minimum height h such that this ball can safely make it through, through this circular motion? Let's look at what happens at point C. At point C, you have the most dangerous moment when it's about to slide. It's, it's going to get off the track. The reason why it doesn't get off the track is because uh, it still satisfies the dynamics of circular motion. You can still do circular motion. At this point, you got two forces, mg going down and n also going down. Both of these forces are going down. They both point to the center of the circle, so as far as the center of mass motion is concerned, this is a centripetal force. It equals mvc squared over r. By vc, I mean the center of mass speed at point c. Okay, now you want minimum speed, minimal height of launch. This will correspond to a minimum value of Vc, which means, means minimum value for n, so that's zero. It's just on the verge of leaving the track. That is the minimum value of Vc. Meanwhile, how do you get that Vc? Well, using conservation of energy, we start from point A, ends up at point C, right? As you go down and up, eventually the height drop is h minus 2r, right? 2r from here to there. So it dropped by h minus 2r. Multiply this by mg, what do I get? I get the loss of potential energy going from A to C. And where does that energy go? That becomes the kinetic energy of the ball. Okay, so so far this is just the same as, you know, is the case of sliding without friction. But at this point, the kinetic energy of the ball at point C, we must now include rotational energy. Okay? must include rotational energy. So again, there are two things you can do. You can use the center of mass, break it down to one half ICM I squared plus one half MVCM squared. That's one thing. Another thing is you can use the contact point, right? That's one half I omega squared. That I is measured from the contact point. Okay, so we're going to take that approach. One half I at the contact point, we usually, uh, you know, we, we, we just, just call it I here in this case. Okay. Or let's say call it point, point IC. C is the contact point right here. Okay, uh, omega squared. Okay, I know what uh, IC is. We did that in the previous problem. If it's a sphere, of course, uh, the answer is slightly different. It's 2 over 5 mR squared, that's for the center of mass, plus another mR squared, using the power axis theorem, another mR squared, and then times omega squared. Okay, omega and Vc are related. Vc is the center of mass speed at this point. Omega is the rotational speed about the center of mass. So you have, again, omega r equals Vc. That is to sustain pure rolling. Okay, so we got equation for Vc, I got equation for omega, and I got a third one to, to, to relate to them. 
I can eliminate VC and omega and we find H minimal, the minimum height necessary to release the ball from so that it can safely make its way. Okay, after some algebra, you solve for omega, you get rid of omega and VC, you got from these three equations you can solve for H. And it turns out H equals 2.7 R. So you're going to launch it from 2.7 times the radius. That is when you have minimum energy, just barely able to clear that. You can compare this with the result that we got before. In a previous chapter, I believe chapter either 7 or 8, when this is a box sliding without any friction. Okay? The minimum height it takes to go from here to there, we can also calculate. The only difference is that this side is simply 1 half mb squared. There is no 1 half i omega squared. And if you did that, you find that h back then was equal to 2.5 r. Now we have something greater than that. In other words, when you consider a rolling motion without just, it's not just a pure sliding without friction. You have to launch it from a higher position, 2.7 r instead of 2.5 r. Does that make sense? Oh yes, it does, because after all, when it reaches this point, it, it is not only doing, you know, center of mass motion, VCM, but on top of that, it's also rotating about the center of mass, which takes an extra amount of energy. Okay, that energy, of course, has to be, uh, has to be obtained by releasing it from a higher place. So it's 2.7 R greater than 2.5 R. It makes sense. So this problem involves conservation of energy with pure rolling, in other words, you have to count rotational energy, plus Newton's cycle applied to that point, you know, the, to sustain the center of mass circular motion. Okay, let's consider one last problem. A uniform rod of mass m and length l can rotate without friction in a vertical plane about a hinge a at one of its ends. Suppose it starts from rest in a vertical position. It's given a very slight tap so that it starts to, to, roll, uh, to, to swing down without any friction about point A. By the, at the very moment when, hinge, when, when this rod is horizontal, we call the final moment. At this point, at this very moment, what I want to know is what is the force provided at the hinge to this rod? Okay, that's what I want to know. What's the, what's the force at the hinge provided to the rod? You know, this force has two components, horizontal and vertical. How do we know that? When the thing rolls, so that it moves, right? The center of mass moves like this. The center of mass is doing a circular motion at this moment. It's doing a circular motion, which means someone has to pull it in to the center, which is point A, the center of the circular motion. So there has to be a force this way. Call it F1. Meanwhile, it also, it also has a vertical component. The force also has a vertical component. How do you know that? Because, you know, after all, at this point, Alpha is not equal to zero, right? Gravity has a, a torque about this point. When alpha is not equal to zero, then you go back to here. You use center of mass as a reference point. You can also apply the torque theorem. If you use center of mass as to, to apply the torque theorem, you'll find mg has no torque. F1 has no torque because it passes through that point. The only possibility is that there has to be an F2, okay? That is the vertical component, which is upwards. Why upwards? because this will provide a clockwise torque like this to sustain alpha, which is clockwise. Let's find F1 and F2. To find F1, the simplest thing to do is realize that F1 is what was necessary for the center of mass to sustain circular motion. So all we need to do really is to find the speed of the center of mass at this point. How do we do that? Well, easiest thing to do is to use conservation of energy from here to there. Okay, do not try to solve the torque theorem directly from here to there because you're going to deal with a, you'll be dealing with a variable torque of gravity. Why variable torque? Because the lever arm changes from zero to a maximum value of L over two continuously. You don't want to mess with the variable torque, but you can use conservation of energy. In, initial energy and final energy are the same, okay? Because the only force doing work is gravity. You know, the, the center of mass descends by distance L over two. So the potential energy lost is mg L over two from initial to final. This all becomes the kinetic energy of rotation about point A. So we have one half I A omega squared. Okay, one half I omega squared. Uh, I know what uh, I A is, that's one third ML squared and then omega squared. From that you can find omega at this point. But what is the center of mass speed? Well, the center of mass is doing a circular motion about 
point A with a radius of half of L. So therefore, VCM at this moment is uh, one half L, that's the radius, times omega, right? And what's that equal to? It is equal to some simple algebra, 3G over 2L. Once you know VCM is, you know VCM, as that's the speed of the center of mass doing a circular motion of radius R, which is L over 2. Therefore, the centripetal force, which is F1, must equal to M times ACM, which is VCM squared over the radius L over 2. And that gives you F1. Okay, there was an algebra mistake here. VCM, if you solve this, you'll find VCM should be square root of 3GL over 4, not 3G over 2L. And you plug that VCM in, you'll find that F1, the horizontal force at the hinge pulling the rod inward, is 3 over 2 mg. Okay, it's one and a half the weight of the rod at this moment. Okay, now let's find F2. There are a couple of things we can do to find F2. You know, if you look at a translation of motion in a vertical direction. I have m2, mg going down, f2 going up. The difference is mg minus f2. That should be equal to I, I'm sorry, mass times ACM in the vertical direction. What is ACM in the vertical direction? That equals alpha times L over 2. So all I have to do is find alpha. Okay, how do you find alpha? Well, the best thing to do to find alpha is to move your torque theorem to apply to here about point A. That, that way the only force having a torque about point A is mg. Okay, in fact torque A equals uh, mg L over 2. And that equals Ia times alpha at this point. And immediately I found alpha to be equal to mg L over 2 Ia, right? Ia is one-third ml squared. So the answer is 3 over 2 g over L. Once you know alpha, then you can, you know, like I said, use this, you know, the uh, um, linear equation, you know, Newton's second law for translation motion in a vertical direction, mg minus f2 equals I e equals mass times ACM, which is alpha times L over 2. That's one thing. But alternatively, you can also use the torque theorem applied to the center of mass this time. Because I know what alpha is. Okay, you apply the torque theorem to the center of mass. Mg has no torque. F1 has no torque. F2 is the only one that has a torque. What's the torque equal to? F2 times L over 2, the lever arm, L over 2. And what is that equal to? That equals ICM alpha, isn't it? Okay, because I'm using the center of mass as a reference frame. Okay. Uh, ICM is 3G, uh, I ICM is 1 twelfth ML squared, right? And alpha is 3G over 2L. So therefore, what's F2? F2 equals to 1 quarter MG. 1 quarter MG. So interestingly enough, at this very moment when the rod is horizontal, F2 is half of the to is a quarter of the total weight, and F1 is two thirds of the total weight, and there there is an explicit relation between F1 and F2. As a matter of fact, if you combine them, you get a net force of action F from the hinge at this point, and you know exactly what this angle is. Okay, in fact, uh, how do you find this angle? Tan unit theta will be equal to uh, F2 over F1, and that is a quarter over 3 over 2, and you know exactly what theta is equal to. Theta equals 9.5 degrees, so the net force at the hinge is pointed this way, 9.5 degrees up from the vertical, from the horizontal, towards this direction. 